Okay, so this is a chapter seven lecture part three. Uh, now to the finale. Uh, understand how to use cost plus pricing and target costing to establish pricing or prices. So this is just how companies come to their pricing conclusion. So uh, some companies can come to pricing conclusions one way. Some have to use other uh, modes of operation. Uh, so how is cost plus pricing used to establish a reasonable price? Well, just think about what that word says. Cost, how much it costs you to make your product, uh, plus pricing. How much money do you need in terms of profit so that you can have a profit, pay yourself, pay your employees, and things of that nature? Uh, companies that produce custom products have often often have a difficult time determining a reasonable market price for their products. Uh, prices for these products can uh, be determined by using cost plus pricing. Cost plus pricing starts with an estimate of cost, right? So always an estimate because you don't have a crystal ball that tells you exactly how much. But an estimate of cost incurred to build a product or provide a service and a certain profit percentage is added to establish the price, right? We need to make a certain amount of money. So how does target costing uh, help establish a reasonable price? Target costing is an approach that mitigates cost efficiency problems associated with introducing new products. Target costing integrates the product design, desired price, desired profit, and desired cost into one process using four steps. So this is a four-step process that says, hey, you know what? Let's let's establish some things first. Let's let's target uh, that our that our, our cost is going to be this much, and let's then engineer it so that that's how much those costs will end up being. So it has a lot to do with engineering and, and product design. So step one, you want to design a product that provides the features and price demanded by the customers. So you must have the features one because if you don't have the features the customers aren't going to buy it and then uh, it also has to be at a price that the customers will purchase it for. Number, step two, uh, determine the company's desired profit. So then you say this is how much we need to make each one of these widgets that gets produced. We need to make $30 per widget produced. Step three, derive, derive the target cost by subtracting the desired profit. All right. So from step two, uh, from this desired price, uh, which is step one. All right, so you have your desired profit. And you, you now you say, okay, this is how much we're we're, we're gonna uh, charge for this. This is how much it's gonna cost, and this is how much we want to make. Then step four, which brings into into the fold an, another part of uh, of the company, engineer the product to achieve the target cost from step three. If the target cost cannot be achieved, the company must go back to step one and reevaluate the features and price. Right. So you go through this, and and it's it's never one two three four in real business. It's mostly like one two three go to four. Now we're going back to one a few more times before we find out where we will typically end up landing. So you want to understand the theory of constraints. We all have constraints unless you're uh, independently uh, wealthy. And if you are independently wealthy, there is just a certain amount of money that you can spend. Uh, but in terms of business, you have a constraint on labor. You have a constraint on uh, overhead. And you have a constraint on uh, you know various uh, costs that you can incur. So how do production constraints impact an organization? Many companies limit resources in such areas as labor hours, machine hours, facilities, and materials. These constraints will probably affect the company's ability to produce goods or service or provide services. And we talked about this at the end of last chapter. Uh, managers must analyze and manage constraints. Five steps associated with the theory of constraints are used to optimize the use of constrained resources often called bottlenecks, right? So you got this bottleneck and you're saying, oh, hey, everything's bunching up right here. Why aren't you guys being more efficient? Well, maybe they can't. Maybe you need to change your, your uh, production model so that they have more help and more assistance where those bottlenecks occur. So what are the five steps associated with the theory of constraints? Number one, find the bottleneck. You need to find where things are slowing up. So if you're processing all of these, um, you know, uh, let's say they're their orders and then the orders need to be audited and then the audits just stick there then that means maybe you need more people to audit step two optimize the use of constrained resources often using contribution margin per constrained resource as a measure and then step three uh, subordinate all non bottleneck resources to the bottleneck right so charge everybody attack let's run towards the bottleneck let's fix it maybe you are on assignment to work on the bottleneck for the next uh, six months until we get things straightened out uh, step four, increase the bottleneck's efficiency and capacity. And then step five is repeat steps one through four. It's a never ending process. Things can always improve. Things can always get better. You want to evaluate qualitative factors when using a differential analysis, right? Qualitative. 
So you have quantitative, those are numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Qualitative, that's uh, how do you feel about our production and how do you feel about our product? So sometimes, like I said, you may have to, due to a qualitative factor, you may have to go ahead and uh, produce a product for someone so that you can retain their business and the business that they may refer. So what qualitative factors should also be considered when performing differential analysis? Although quantitative data are, is important uh, when making decisions, management must also consider qualitative factors. For example, if production is outsourced, qualitative factors include uh, product quality provided by the supplier. If the, if the quality is crap, then, then, then now you're looking at uh, another problem. Uh, financial stability of the supplier, like what if they go out of business? Then you're stuck and what do you do from there? Employee morale for employees at the firm where production was outsourced. Oh man, they're sending all our jobs, you know, all across the country. You have to think about those things. Analyze the impact that joint costs have on decision making, right? And this is all the way in the appendix. And I'll tell you, when you get to this part, when you're reading the book, don't spend as much time on this, uh, but, but, you know, go through it and peruse it. But everything up until this point, those are the main factors of what's going to be on your quizzes and tests. Uh, so it says, what are joint products uh, when two or more products are produced from a single input? So if I am uh, a company and I, we log, we cut down the trees, and then we make desks, and then uh, we make skateboards, right? So it's a, it's a single single input but different products, right? So I take the wood, some I make use to make desks, some I use to make skateboards. The cost of the single input and the related manufacturing process cost must be allocated to each of the joint products. The split off point, and the split off point is when this wood it comes down the line, everything you know gets done to it, it gets treated. But then the split off point is when it goes to uh, off to become a skateboard or off to become a desk. So the split off point is a point at which identical products emerge uh, from the production product and that or process, and that will be a desk or a skateboard. So what are joint costs and how are they allocated to, to products? Joint costs are the cost of impacts uh, required to produce joint products. Uh, there are two commonly used methods to allocate joint costs to the joint products. So physical quantities, the actual physical you could touch tangible quantities, and sales value method. So regardless of the allocation method, total joint costs and total profit remain the same. No matter which method you use, they're still going to remain the same. So how is the physical quantities method used to allocate joint costs to joint products? Uh, the physical quantities method allocates joint costs based on physical measures of output. So if you have 100 and I make uh, 60 skateboards and 40 desks, then you know that's how it's going to be uh, allocated. Uh, typical measures include pounds, yards, gallons, or board feet of material, right? So if we're dealing with the wood, we're probably going to deal with uh, uh, either pounds or, or, or feet or something of that nature. So how is the sales value method used to allocate joint costs to joint products? Uh, the sales value method allocates joint costs to products based on the relative sales value of each product at the split off point, right? So maybe my skateboard cost, uh, maybe it's those new flashy uh, penny skateboards cost about 100 bucks or uh, <clears throat> 120 bucks and my desk uh, that costs $300. Uh, the sales value method assumes that profit as a percent of sales will remain the same across all products. So maybe, uh, let's say you sell the exact same amount of desks as you do skateboards, then you know your contribution margin is going to be uh, greater if you're selling the and everything remains constant if you're selling uh, uh, the more desks than the skateboard, right? And as I always say, the numbers will dictate and tell you uh, what you should sell more of. And that is it. So that's uh, slide number 52. That's the end. Uh, I know you're saying finally, but uh, of chapter 7. So we have three three lectures to review. Be sure to read the chapter. Uh, the you know the 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 problems that they have here. They are referencing the problems in the book. Uh, be sure to take your quiz, and also be sure to have a good day and a great week. Uh, once you're completed with chapter 7, then we move on to finalize with chapter 8 and chapter 9.